This video is a one-hour presentation of the USGS public lecture series titled Land Subsidence, the Lowdown on the Drawdown. The presentation is being hosted in the USGS Menlo Park facility. The host welcomes the audience and introduces the speaker, Michelle Sneed, who is a USGS hydrologist. As Michelle is giving her presentation, she is continually pointing to and referring to slides presented on the screen. The slides are a mixture of charts, graphs, and photos. At the end of the presentation, there is a question and answer session with members of the audience. have to figure out the logistics of my script and the microphone. Well, good evening and welcome to the United States Geological Survey's public lecture for March 2019. I'm Diane Garcia and I'm with our Science Information Services group. And I just, um, I'm really truly happy to see you all here after our brief hiatus. So thank you for uh, making the effort to get here in person. Um, before we get started, we always like to plug the next lecture, and we are having it in April, on April 18th. It is the story of California's changing e ecosystems as observed from space. Um, there are flyers in the back. I hope you grab one, and you save the date, and you come back for that. It's being given by Kristen Bird from our Pacific region, so that, should, that promises to be an interesting and wonderful talk, too. But what you're here for is tonight's lecture, Land Subsidence, the Lowdown on the Drawdown, the Link Between Groundwater Use and Sinking Landscapes. And it's being presented tonight by Michelle Sneed. She's a hydrologist with our California Water Science Center since 1994. She received her bachelor and master's degrees in geology from California State University, Sacramento, where she periodically teaches geology classes. She has published many studies of land subsidence related to fluid pressure changes in areas throughout California and other areas in the western United States. Recent studies in the San Joaquin and Coachella Valleys explore the impact of subsidence on water conveyance infrastructure. She is a member of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, Land Subsidence International Initiative, the recognized leader in promoting global land subsidence studies. The USGS monthly public lecture is just tickle pink to bring you a program about land subsidence. And I'm gonna ask that you please hold your questions till the end. And now I'm gonna ask that you give Michelle a really nice warm welcome. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, I know that we have had a couple of months off here, so I'm really happy to see you all. So uh, I've been working in land subsidence for quite a while, and being part of this UNESCO group uh, the last uh, four or five years or so has really um, broadened my knowledge on subsidence that's happening all over the world. My focus certainly is California, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with kind of a world perspective. I don't want uh, you to feel like California is sort of alone in this issue. Um, it is widespread. So if you've seen any image of land subsidence ever, you've ever seen a talk, uh, you've probably seen this image of Joe Poland. He's a, he's a USGS guy, and he was really smart to use a power pole as a way to illustrate land subsidence. Land subsidence is not an easy thing to photograph. And I get plenty of journalists, photographers say, show me where I can take a picture of land subsidence. And then I have to kind of talk them off the ledge a little bit. Um, so he's showing here, using the telephone pole, where the land surface was in 1925, which is 30 feet above where he's standing in 1977. Though we haven't come up with a better idea of how to illustrate land subsidence, so we just copy Joe. 
Uh, and so here's a more recent uh, photo uh, using the same kind of idea to show where the land surface was in 1965, uh, which is above my head or above my feet, about eight and a half feet or so. Um, so I'm going to show a couple more of these images uh, as we go along. So first to just get us on the same page of what, what land subsidence really is. In the broadest sense, it is a gradual or a sudden sinking of the Earth's surface owing to processes that are happening either on the surface or below the surface. And I'll expand on that idea. Almost all of the land subsidence in our nation, more than 47,000 square miles, which is about the size of Pennsylvania or so, is a result of our exploitation of groundwater. Almost all of that subsidence is caused by the compaction of susceptible alluvial aquifer systems that accompanies overdraft. Overdraft just means we're pumping more out than is replenished year to year to year to year, overdraft. Kind of like a bank account, you can't right, keep taking money out of the bank without putting as much back in, at least at some point. So I want to start with a world perspective of where subsidence is happening in the world. So this map shows a lot of locations in the United States and China. You don't see any dots in Africa. You don't see any in South America, uh, one in Australia. The reason that it's uh, prevalent in the United States and China is because we have a lot of people. We're rich countries. Rich countries use more resources than poor countries do. And so we have a lot of subsidence in richer countries. Now, that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened in Africa or South America. We just don't know if it has or not. We don't have any data to support that. So. Um, this is sort of an unknown. Uh, some of the uh, places in um, the world that are fastening at the uh, fastest rates recently, uh, Tehran, Iran, is subsiding very, very quickly. Um, but just a few years ago, when we were really in the sort of third, fourth, fifth year of our drought, the fastest subsidence rates were happening in the San Joaquin Valley worldwide. Luckily, we've had a couple of, uh, of reasonably good precipitation years, and so uh, the situation has changed a little bit for us. Uh, we're not uh, leading the race anymore, which is good. This is a race you don't want to win. So scoping down to the United States, you'll see that we have a lot of identified subsidence areas in the west. You also see some in the Gulf Coast area, Texas, Louisiana as well as some on the East Coast. Now on the West, right, we're talking about groundwater withdrawal, right? And the West doesn't have a lot of surface water. So we use more groundwater than most Eastern uh, states do and, and uh, some Midwestern states. And so that's why we see a lot of subsidence issues in the West. On the Gulf Coast, they withdraw groundwater for use, but they also pump oil and gas. And oil and gas is just another fluid, and aquifer systems uh, respond, alluvial aquifer systems respond in a very similar way to pumping oil and gas as they do water. Um, the benefit that uh, much of California has, uh, where our severe areas of subsidence are, are not necessarily on the coast. Uh, we do have them on the coast in the Gulf, and on the east, in the Chesapeake Bay, you see some areas over here that have identified land subsidence. It is a big problem on the coast. Even really small amounts of subsidence are a big problem on the coast because sea level is rising. So you have the land sinking and the sea level rising, making the relative land subsidence much worse. Not only that, but in the Chesapeake Bay, on the east coast in particular, we have lots of infrastructure and assets that are right on the coast. Biggest naval shipyard, things like that. So really small amounts of subsidence can cause a big problem. And that's something I have learned over the last 
oh, probably 15 years or so, that it really started to take hold that, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter just how much subsidence you have, but where that subsidence is occurring. And that'll be a sort of a reoccurring uh, theme of this talk. Scoping down to California, uh, so I have a map here on uh, the left side of the screen that shows the areas that have been identified as having land subsidence issues at one time or another. And again, California, you know, we use a lot of water. We have surface water in the north. Uh, we do have these huge conveyance systems that move that water to the south, um, but there just sort of isn't enough to go around uh, much of the time, and so groundwater pumping makes up that deficit. So we have a lot of groundwater pumping. The, I have a few images up here. So this image is of the California Aqueduct and the Delta Mendota Canal. So they're very close to each other near the pumps in Tracy. And uh, as we'll learn going through this talk, these canals are being severely impacted by subsidence. They're very, very sensitive infrastructure to subsidence, and I'll explain more about that. To the right of that is just a photo of a benchmark. These are um, monuments that we use to survey over and over and over again to get an idea of what kind of vertical land surface change is happening between the surveys. This image down here is uh, a protruding well. Now, if you've ever poured concrete, you probably haven't done it in air. Um, <laughs> right? so, <laughs> so what's happened is that um, when the concrete was poured, the land surface was higher, and that concrete has, is bonded to the well casing. And so as the land has subsided, the well casing is holding all of this up. Uh, if it hasn't happened already, this well casing likely will collapse on itself. It won't be able to sort of take those stresses uh, of the, the causes um, or the stresses of the subsidence. So that will probably collapse someday. This is a telltale sign of subsidence. This is an image here on the lower right of the Delta Mendota Canal, and you, know, you see a, a rupture in the concrete lining of the canal. Now, we don't know for sure that subsidence caused this rupture, but it's in a suspicious location because this area has been affected by what we call differential subsidence uh, for quite some time. And when I say differential subsidence, I'm talking about subsidence that happens in different places at different rates. It's not all happening at the same rate everywhere. And so you can imagine if you have one area that's subsiding and one that's not, any infrastructure that, causes, that crosses this area that isn't really flexible is going to break, right? So, um, so this is a, uh, an example of, of what can happen. Like I said, we don't know for sure that it's caused by subsidence, but it's pretty suspicious. So I'm gonna talk about the San Joaquin Valley today, the area uh, in red there. But before I do, I just wanted to make you aware that there are lots of land subsidence studies um, that are going on now or that have recently been happening. And this is going to, um, there's going to be more and more land subsidence studies in California as we move forward because of a new law that's been passed. And I'll get to that uh, near the end. But today I'm just going to talk about uh, Central Valley or the San Joaquin Valley in particular. <laughs> So a lot of times in these talks, one of the first questions that I get at the end is, you know, well, what about subsidence in the delta? Is that the same process or is that a different process? Uh, so I preemptively strike uh, here to tell you about it. Um, and it, it is not the same. Uh, uh, the subsidence in the delta is a very superficial process, while subsidence in places like the San Joaquin Valley, the Coachella Valley, the Santa Clara Valley, which is a little closer to home, are quite different, it's a deep process. So with delta compaction, uh, it all lies in, in the peat. So when there's a, a waterlogged system, right, and it's, it's tidal, the delta is very, very wet. Uh, and when vegetation decomposes, it decomposes very, very slowly in the water. And it makes this wonderful soil, wonderful soil for 
farming, very, very rich. So we like to use that soil for farming, but you can't farm in waterlogged soil. So we pump it out, right? We drain the soil. As it turns out, when this peat, this peat layer, this really rich uh, organic sediment is exposed to the air, it vaporizes, it oxidizes, it disappears, it turns to gas. So this process is kind of like somebody going along with a shovel and removing the top bits of the land surface. Very superficial process. It's very different uh, when we're talking about aquifer system compaction. This is a very deep process. Now, aquifer systems are composed of sands and gravels and clays and silts, different types of sediments. Well, if you've ever been to the beach and you picked up a handful of sand and you look at it. If you look at it carefully, you notice that the, the sand grains are fairly rounded. Well, clay is not. Clay is platy. And clay is kind of our, our villain in the compaction story. Um, the aquifer system compaction is concentrated in the clay layers. So clay layers have this structure where it's very platy. And when it's deposited, it's deposited in more or less random orientations. Now this is a bit exaggerated for illustrative purposes, but you get the point. In between these grains is water. Okay, that's where water is stored. And there, there's, that's called a, a pore space. And um, as we withdraw water, this pore spray space here, the pressure drops as water levels drop, and the grains get a little bit closer together. When water levels come back up, that pressure increases and it pushes those grains apart a little bit. That's a very elastic response, like a rubber band. You know, you just pull it in, pull it out, right? It goes back to the same shape. But when you start to withdraw water in a way that continuously lowers groundwater levels. We get to a point that's called, it's a critical threshold of water level. Call it the critical head. You might hear it called the pre-consolidation head or the pre-consolidation stress. And when we pass that threshold, which is sometimes estimated as the previous lowest groundwater level, those grains rearrange themselves. So they're not just bowing out anymore um, and you know, deforming elastically. They rearrange themselves into more of a stack. And so a couple of things happen. One is that it's gonna take up a lot less space, right? So your clay unit is gonna get thinner. And you can see that the pore spaces have collapsed, right? They're much smaller. And this is, a, this is not recoverable. Those grains, even if you really put a lot of water back in the aquifer system and really pressurized it, yeah, it might push these grains apart a little bit, but they're never gonna go back into this random orientation. Okay, so this represents a permanent loss in storage capacity of the aquifer system. Now through history, uh, this has been estimated in various basins. Um, in the deserts, sometimes we hear somewhere between 5 and 15% of the aquifer system capacity has been lost due to compaction. In the San Joaquin Valley, there was a study done in the 60s by Joe Pollan, uh, and they estimated that about 30% of the water that was being produced was caused by the compaction of clay. And in the San Joaquin Valley, we have a lot of clay something like 60% of the aquifer system is clay. So the potential for compaction is really, really large. Um, again, this is not fixable. And as you know, we'll start, uh, we'll talk a little bit at the end about why this really matters. And it's because in California, we've built reservoirs in all the best places already. Um, not that we couldn't build a couple more, but Aquifer systems are going to be used as managed reservoirs. It's already happening in some places. Um, and so moving forward, we're impacting 
the ability for these aquifers to store water. Very similar to maybe you've heard about dams through time, and reservoirs. They silt up, right, as the sediments are coming in with the water into a reservoir, the sediments settle out and your reservoir is smaller now because now there's sediments taking the place where water could be stored. So it's, it's a, analogous to that. So why does subsidence matter? Um, most people care about subsidence because it damages infrastructure and to fix it is very expensive. Some of the most sensitive infrastructure are canals and the reason is because canals are built on very small gradients because we like to use gravity to move the water. It's cheap and it's relentless, right? Gravity's always there. And if the whole canal subsided the same, that gradient would be maintained and you'd probably be listening to somebody else tonight. Um, <laughs> but that's not how it goes. It's differential, right? And for, so for a canal to work under gravity, every elevation upstream has to be higher than every elevation downstream. When you have differential subsidence, you have a little sort of hole, right? A sag in the canal. And so you can see here, well, that's probably okay. You know, water's still gonna flow downhill, but it's gonna get backed up here. And the result is that that canal cannot move as much water as it was designed to. So the capacity of the canal is impacted. Freeboard is the term that's used for, to describe the distance between the top of the water surface and infrastructure that crosses it, so a bridge. So when you go to a bridge and you look over the bridge, you expect to see water going under the bridge, right? In this case, you see water going, um, if I can find my mouse, into the bridge, right? So this creates kind of a, a choke point Right? So you have this slug of water moving through and now it has to fit in this space underneath the bridge. Um, and so it's running into the bridge. And this also can impact the integrity of that bridge uh, as erosion. You know, water is pretty magical at finding its way around places. Uh, if you've ever done plumbing work, you know that. <laughs> um, and so you could uh, damage the, the, uh, the bridge as well. In fact, there are several bridges that are slated to be replaced over canals in the San Joaquin Valley. You used to be able to kayak underneath that, by the way. That's how they used to inspect the bottom of the bridges. So while canals are the most sensitive to differential subsidence in particular, Really, any infrastructure that crosses these areas uh, can be impacted. Roads, railways, bridges, pipelines, um, wells that I've already explained. Um, here's a, another picture of a well in the upper right-hand corner. And this is in an active vineyard, and it's a very deep well. It's, it was drilled for oil and gas exploration. And when they drilled it in 2010, they painted the top of it orange so that farm equipment wouldn't hit it. Right? It's in an active vineyard. Well, within two years, you can see that two more feet of that pipe are exposed. So I think I've already shown you a picture of a ruptured canal, and I've showed you this as well. So the other sort of side of uh, impacts from subsidence are natural resources. And I've already explained the aquifer uh, system uh, storage capacity being reduced. But as you can imagine, right, when you're in a landscape, you find wetlands and rivers in the lowest places of the landscape. As those lower places, the topography is changing, right? Now you might have spaces now that are lower than where the river is. So the rivers uh, may change course, right? They may migrate, as well as wetlands. Maybe some wetlands disappear and new ones emerge in new places. So we measure subsidence using a, a variety of methods. Um, we use benchmarks a lot, I showed you a picture of this already, where we can survey over and over again. Back in the day, and even sometimes now, we use some leveling surveys. 
um, on these benchmarks to track their change over time. More recently, we tend to use GPS. And this is a case where this is a continuous GPS station. It's set up all the time, and measures uh, the land surface elevation every 15 seconds or so. On the upper right is INSAR, Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. And this is a, a remote sensing technique. Um, we tend to use data more from satellites, but this can also be collected from airplanes. And in this way, we orbit the Earth and we take uh, pictures, radar images of the land surface over and over again. We can process those together and make a change map. And then the lower right photo is of an extensometer. Now, an extensometer is different from these other methods because GPS, spirit leveling, INSAR, they all measure the change of the land surface. What is the land subsidence? Extensometers actually measure the thinning or the slight thickening of aquifer systems. Uh, so there's a specific depth that these are anchored to. Um, in this particular photo, that one's anchored at about almost 1,200 feet. And so it's measuring the aquifer system thickness and how that changes in that interval. That's a very helpful measurement for water managers. Because, if, okay, you know you have land subsidence, but where's the compaction happening? How are you supposed to manage the land subsidence if you don't know if the compaction's happening at 100 feet below land surface or 1,000 feet below land surface, right? So it's a really valuable uh, measurement, and it's the only way that we know to date how to measure that compaction, that thickness change. So I have two lists up here, and they're the same contents, but they're ordered slightly different. Because I'm going to show you a lot of maps, and I'm going to show you some time series of what's happened at particular locations. And so um, as we make maps, right, we want higher spatial resolution, right? If we want to make maps, we get more measurements per space as we move down in this list. On the right-hand side, we get more measurements in time as we move down the list. And we use these data sets together. Um, we, use, we get maps of subsidence, and then we really need to understand what's happening through time, at least at some locations. So I'm going to show you data from almost all of these methods. Uh, the two I'm going to leave out are LIDAR and radar altimetry. And the reason that I'm going to leave out LIDAR is because it's really not being used for subsidence measurements yet. The technology is there, but it's very expensive. So it's just not being used. I think it will be uh, as we move forward. And radar altimetry is um, kind of in its infancy. There's a few papers um, out there that have been written uh, using radar altimetry for subsidence, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that today. All right, so the history of subsidence in the San Joaquin Valley um, shows that, and this is a map on the left-hand side of 1926 to 1970, and I know it's kind of light, um, but the, the uh, take-home point here is that most of the subsidence was happening on the west side of the valley, okay? So this is a map, right? And so we used spirit leveling techniques on benchmarks to make this map back in the day. Well, now I'm going to show you a time series of a particular location on that map. And so in the upper graph here, you see water levels declining, right? There's a seasonal thing going on here, right? We pump more in the summer than we do in the winter. Uh, and water levels were declining up until about here, 19, early 1970s. And they started to recover rapidly. Here you see the same thing with compaction. So there's an extensometer at this location. And you can see, yeah, compaction was happening, but wow, it really kind of um, minimized in the early 70s. So what happened in the early 70s? California aqueduct started to deliver water. And so farmers over here didn't have to pump 
nearly as much groundwater as they did. Some probably didn't pump at all. And so water levels came back up, except during droughts, right? So we have a huge water level decline here. You see that subsidence reinitiated. It was a short but severe drought, 1976 to 77. And then you see water levels resume recovery and compaction, right? That, uh, that stopped happening. If you notice, there's a couple little bars right in the bottom here. That's expansion. So that's, there's an elastic component that was occurring, like the rubber band, okay? Which that, that happens in the coarse grain materials um, all the time. Uh, and so, um, again, another drought, water levels decline, but then after the drought, recovery again. So, uh, so this looked very promising. It looked like the California aqueduct kind of fix the problem, right? And so when you fix a problem, you don't keep throwing money at it, right? And so what happened was that subsidence studies, subsidence measurements sharply reduced at this time. Because, you know, you fix the problem, you have other, other fish to fry, and you're going to put your resources there. Well, what we found when we started to look at subsidence again um, really uh, because of the 2007 to 2009 drought, so the drought before the one that we just had, um, you know, we thought we'd find m maybe something similar, you know, that, okay, we'll probably find subsidence during drought, but then um, when there's enough water coming down the canals, it's probably going to be relieved again. Well, what we found was that subsidence was occurring, but it wasn't really happening in the locations that it was before. And it's not that no subsidence happened over here, but not very much compared to up here and down here. It was kind of embarrassing because we stopped looking for a while. Um, so the next two graphs I'm going to show you, the first one is this location here, and the second one is this location. So this is kind of what we expected to find. Right? So in all my graphs, by the way, brown is subsidence and blue is water level. Okay, so uh, what we see here, this is a continuous GPS station, and we see, okay, yeah, okay, during droughts there's subsidence, you might expect that. Uh, but between droughts, it pretty much flattens out, right? And then here's another drought, lots of subsidence, but then kind of flattened out, even got a fair amount of rebound here during that really wet year a couple of years ago. So this is what we thought we'd find, uh, and we did, until we started looking at other locations. In those locations, we found that it wasn't necessarily a drought-related phenomenon anymore. Uh, in this loca location, you see that subsidence happened even between the droughts, and even during that wet period, uh, kind of slowed down a little bit, but still subsidence happening. So this is no longer a drought-related phenomenon. Um, not everybody gets surface water, and certainly not everybody gets enough surface water to meet their demand. So here's a map of more recent subsidence. So this is just a two-year period from 2008 to 2010, so largely a drought period. And you can see that a large part of the valley is, is impacted by at least an inch of subsidence. So if it's pink, it's at least an inch and as much as 21 inches or so. So almost a foot a year was happening. And to give you some perspective on the historical subsidence compared to this more recent subsidence, here you go, right? So it's kind of on the west side and now it's sort of moved to the east a little bit. There was that recent subsidence again. So I'm going to show you uh, 84 years of data from this particular site. Now, it's on the Delta Mendota Canal. And the Delta Mendota Canal was completed before the, the aqueduct. And the things that were learned at this site by Joe Poland were actually applied to the California aqueduct. They said, you know, where the, the Delta Mendota Canal is coming out into the valley, we see more problems. So make that California aqueduct closer to the coast ranges, and we think there'll be less problems. So here's what that, uh, that site looks like. And this is a combination of early leveling surveys as early as 1935, 
uh, and here's where the extensometer came into operation in 1957. Uh, and this one actually has quite a bit more data than almost all of the other sites. The, the folks that run the Delta Mendota Canal, the Delta Mendota Water Authority, kept this site going. Um, and there's only a 10 year gap or so, which is, is really small. Most of the extensometers have a 40 year gap. Um, they were kind of put to sleep in the early uh, 80s or late 70s. Uh, and some of them we've, we've uh, brought back into operation. So this really kind of shows how this is related to the groundwater levels. Um, so again, you have this sort of rebound starting in the early 70s when the California aqueduct started to deliver water. And then you see you know, big declines um, of the groundwater level during drought. And by the way, these declines are really, really fast. They're very large magnitude declines for really short um, droughts in some cases. Cases And this is partially a result of that reduced aquifer system storage capacity. It can't store as much water as it could anymore, so water levels decline and recover much faster than they did before. So you can really pick out the droughts here. This, uh, this is sort of hidden uh, behind here, the brown, but you see a little step down during that drought. And here you see step down during the drought and, uh, and this one's real obvious too. So when I was talking about the process of aquifer system compaction, I talked about two main things. One is declining groundwater levels, and the other is the presence of clay, right? So in the San Joaquin Valley, we have both of these things. Uh, we have water level declines, and we have lots and lots of clay. And um, I will show you here in just a moment uh, what the Corcoran is. So I know that's probably a term maybe you haven't heard. So water level declines. Yep, we got them. So here, this is a, a wells in the town of Mendota. And I'm showing a shallow well in the light blue and a deep well in the dark blue. And when I say shallow and deep, the shallow is above the Corcoran clay. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute and the deep well is below the Corcoran clay. You can see they kind of mirror each other, uh, but certainly the water levels in the deep system uh, have a lot more variability. Uh, maybe not seasonally, uh, you see large seasonal swings here, um, but these respond uh, with much greater declines during droughts and recover more between the droughts. And I uh, circled historically lowest groundwater levels because remember I mentioned that that critical head, that threshold at which the clay starts to respond differently is a result of um, the history of the aquifer system and historical stresses that that aquifer system has experienced. And in this case, it looks like if we use um, uh, the previous lowest groundwater level as a kind of proxy for that, then um, these groundwater levels are certainly below that depth, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So this is what the aquifer system structure looks like. I said it's a bunch of sands and gravels and lots of clay. And uh, there's kind of two, two systems. There is some connection between the two, um, particularly since humans got involved because we drill wells through them both, right, and provide a, a conduit, a pipe basically, that connects the two. So here you see this Corcoran clay. It's a regionally extensive confining layer to clay. And a lot of folks, even to this day, think that, and you might think this right off the bat, oh, that must be the offender. That must be the clay that's causing all of this subsidence. Well, as it turns out, it's not our biggest enemy. Uh, it is draining. It is compacting. Um, but it's these clay lenses, and they're all over the place. If, if I drilled a well where I'm standing, and I drilled a well in the first row, and I tried to correlate units across that, I would not be able to do it. It is an assemblage. It's mixed up. It's complicated. But there is a lot of these clay lenses. Um, and so we find that these are our biggest offenders, uh, and especially in the confined aquifer system. 
But that's because we've pumped more from the confined aquifer system than the shallow system. The reason is the water quality is better down there. And so that is what has primarily been pumped. And so there's some thoughts out there that think, well, if we just pump the unconfined aquifer, figure out a way to use that water that's reduced water quality, um, ways to use it beneficially, then we won't cause compaction and subsidence. Well, there's a lot of clay in that uh, area as well. It's, it's all the way down from the top. Um, the more you drill down, the more it's just clay, 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 lots of clay. So this is another way to look at that. And I know this is a, a little bit strange to look at. Um, but here's Redding up here, and here's Bakersfield down here. And these are well logs kind of hung in space. And so um, um, Claudia Font has put together, my colleague, has put together the Central Valley Hydrologic Model. And this simulates flow throughout the system. Well, to do that, you really need to understand the geology to get that um, right. And so we digitized a bunch of uh, well logs. And then we kind of hung them in space. Uh, and it looks like this. And the take home here is that there's a lot of blue, right, which is clay. So we're going to take a look at this area briefly. We'll come back to it. But I just wanted to show how much water conveyance is in this one area. Uh, we can see the California Aqueduct on the edge, the Delta Mendota Canal, the San Joaquin River. All of those deliver water, right? Uh, the east side bypass was built for flood control. So it doesn't deliver water. It moves water away. Um, San Joaquin Valley has a rich history of flooding, and the San Joaquin River would just get overwhelmed. And so the east side bypass was built to help ease flooding on the San Joaquin River and move water out um, faster. But before we go on, I want to show you something that was kind of surprising to me during this study, um, is that uh, the box you see, most of that is out of this sort of contour area, meaning that there's less than an inch of subsidence that's happening wherever it's not pink. So here's a close-up of that area. And when we were studying subsidence along the Delta Mendota Canal, we looked at all of their infrastructure locations along the canal and uh, figured out what amount of subsidence was happening at each of those locations. And so in the northern part here, you see, OK, yeah, there's some, a little bit of subsidence, but really not very much. You see a lot down here and a lot down here, right? So I think, wow, that's the big problem. That's where our maximum subsidence is. Well, when we were in the drought and we got some, some spring rains, and so the Delta Mendota Water Authority was given five days to move as much water as they could from the Delta to Phillips San Luis Reservoir. San Luis Reservoir was critically low levels. Five days, not an amount of water, but an amount of time. And what they found out was that just this little bit of subsidence impacted their ability to do that. Right? So they had uh, what they would call choke points at check seven, and then another one at check nine, where the water you know, you can see that the gradient's kind of messed up, right? It's, it's uphill. And so they weren't able to fill San Luis as much as they could if it weren't for subsidence. Now, granted, this is only a three-year period. Probably more happened before then and more has happened since then. Uh, but that was really an eye-opener for me. Again, it doesn't necessarily matter how much you have, but where it's occurring. So this is another way to look at that same information. So this blue line is the original design elevation of the canal. And the red was created by using the Central Valley Hydrologic Model, simulating subsidence based on the data that we had. And here maybe is a little bit clearer how these choke points uh, affect the ability to move water. All right, so let's look at some time series now. We've been looking at some maps. Let's look at some time series. And so here are four locations where continuous GPS data is collected. And I've circled 
uh, this axis here because it's different than the rest. Everywhere else is 0 to 20 inches, but Chowchilla, this, this uh, particular site, needed a bigger y-axis, so I just wanted to call your attention to that. And so we see a couple of different things happening here. At this location, we see subsidence only during droughts, and this is the same graph that you saw earlier. It's at this location. So this tells me that this location around here, when, wa when surface water is available, they have access to it, they use it, and they're not, they're not pumping enough to cause subsidence. Right, but these other locations, and this, by the way, this is the other one that you saw already as well, you see that there is still subsidence even between the drought periods. So this tells us that they may have access to surface water, they may not, but if they do, it's certainly not enough to meet demand, uh, even between drought periods. This is a cross-section of this east side bypass. This is this flood control structure I mentioned. So water flows northwest, right? It's going to go out the Golden Gate eventually. Um, and so water's flowing here, right? And see, it has to fill up this hole before it can continue. And now it has to fill up this hole before it can continue. And, uh, and it, it hasn't happened yet, but it's possible that it would spill over the sides of the levees um, before, it could, before it would continue going downhill. That didn't happen even a couple of years ago when we had all of that uh, rain, that really heavy year. Um, I was pretty impressed. Water managers actually did a really fantastic job of controlling flows and stopping flooding and um, it was kind of impressive. So uh, a couple of, of images. This is, this is sort of my, my good news slides. Um, and so we've been uh, doing a series of these images. And this one's to 2016. And uh, you can see there's 8.6 feet of subsidence at this location. We did it again in 2018. And we got no additional subsidence. Right? It's been a good couple of years. So this location really benefited from that additional availability of surface water. Here's another location, just about the same story. What's interesting here is that this really gives you some idea of how rates have changed. So in 16 years, 2.3 feet. In the next four years, 0.6 feet. That's about the same rate, right? If you multiplied this times four, and that times four to be equal to 16 years, it's about the same rate. But then the next eight years, right, 3.3 feet, a, a hugely uh, ramped up subsidence rate. Um, we were in a drought during much of the time between 2008 and 2016. Uh, and 2018, just a little bit more, right? And so here you can see that, right, that rate has actually de decreased the last five years compared to the previous five years. All right, so let's take a look at Pixley, the same kind of southern part of the valley. I call it the Pixley area. There's a little town called Pixley. Uh, and so this is the same kind of situation. Again, Corcoran, notice 70 inches of subsidence is the, uh, is the, the y-axis here. The rest are 30. Um, again, this is subsidence only during drought. So look at that, Friant Kern Canal. Apparently, that area gets surface water when it's available. By the way, the Friant Current Canal has been in the news a lot lately, and it's because it's been severely impacted by subsidence. It can only move about 60% of the water that it was designed to move. It's been severely impacted by subsidence. Um, here you can see, wow, you know, really rapid subsidence during the drought at this location. Uh, during that very wet year, it flattened out, but um, has sort of continued on after that. All right, I'm going to uh, show you a few graphs of extensometers. I won't spend a lot of time on these, but I spend time with these extensometers, so I have to show you the data because well, it's hard to collect, you know? <laughs> um, and so, again, brown is compaction, blue is water levels, and, uh, and the arrows are really just showing what happened that year, right? So probably not a huge surprise during the drought, right? We had subsidence, but that really wet year, we got a little back, right? In this case... A little less than an inch and a half, uh, about a half inch here. Um, 
And these, by the way, are the depths of these excensometers. Remember, we're measuring very specific depth intervals um, with these sites. Here's the uh, southern few sites. And uh, this site in Porterville, right on the Frank Kern Canal, uh, is brand new. So we don't have very much data from it. We just started to collect data from it last June. Um, I was pretty shocked when we first put in an instrument to see this guy tick down so fast. Uh, but, but we've gotten some back. So some of that is an elastic response at least. And last time I was there, water levels were still going up. So I expect that we'll get a little bit more rebound out of the site. And that's really, uh, that's really good news for that, for that canal and those folks that have to manage it. All right, so depths of compaction. As I, as I mentioned, extensometer is the only way to really figure out at what depth intervals this might be happening. And so what I'm showing here is just a schematic of uh, this particular extensometer, which is anchored in the top of the Corcoran clay, just above the Corcoran clay. So this is just shallow system that this extensometer is measuring. And then the GPS theoretically goes right to the center of the Earth. So this is the whole deal. This is all the subsidence. But I graph these together, and you see that there's much less compaction at the extensometer than at the GPS site. So we conclude then that most of the compaction is happening below the top of the Corcoran clay, right? Because that's where this is um, anchored, in the top of the Corcoran clay. We've done quite a bit of work to figure out if the Corcoran clay uh, is a big offender. And as I mentioned, it's really not. It's a very thick clay, hydrologically very, very tight. Um, you know, you could think about maybe silly putty. If you spread silly putty out and you pour water on the top and you wait for it to come to the other side, you got a long wait. It's going to uh, evaporate, right? You're going to fall asleep long before it's going to go through to the other side. Um, well, the Corcoran clay is very, very tight like that. Uh, it doesn't move water very fast. And so um, through some sort of modeling studies uh, and uh, geological studies of the actual material that's in the Corcoran clay, um, we find that it is, it is draining, it is, those pore spaces are getting smaller, but it's really, really slow. Um, in maybe a couple thousand years, we'll shake our fist at it and say we should have tried to do something about it. Um, but it's just, it's not in the right time horizons for um, water managers to really think or worry about it. Okay, so then sort of the next question people want to know is, the compaction permanent, was it inelastic or was it elastic, right? Recoverable or permanent? And so we start to look at the critical head, right? The previous lowest groundwater level uh, and how the system responds to that. And so here we see that the critical head in this upper graph, so this is above the Corcoran clay and this is below the Corcoran clay. It was set in July, 1991 um, for this particular well, right? We don't have a record going back hundreds of years or anything, um, but this, it's a pretty old well, and the lowest was set in 1991. By the way, that was the end of a drought, right? And so that's not surprising that water levels got to low levels. Well, in this case, we see that water levels did go beyond that level in 2016, but for a really, really short period and just barely. Uh, it takes time for these clays to drain and compact. And so the conclusion is, is that in the upper system, uh, that any compaction that occurred during 2016 was probably elastic, probably recoverable. If we look at the lower graph, see the critical head was set in August 1992, same drought as this guy, but set a little bit later. That was the lowest groundwater level. And you can see here in 2009, we did surpass it for a little bit, right? but not for very long, and you kind of, okay, reset the critical head. That's the new previous lowest groundwater level. But then we move forward, right, and we see we're just lowering, lowering, lowering. So the critical head is going down. And so our conclusion then would be that, yeah, most of the compaction that happened in the deep system is probably permanent. Probably not going to get that back. So what can be done about it? Well, from a scientific 
Point of view, it's super easy. Just stop lowering groundwater levels. No problem. You ask a manager that, and they're going to pull out their hair, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really uh, hard problem to address. But, um, but that really is the secret. If you stop lowering groundwater levels, then your subsidence will stop. Um, and so it's going to be some combination, right, of reducing groundwater withdrawal or increasing recharge, right? So maybe you decrease groundwater demand, Maybe you limit or redistribute the groundwater use or bring in some surface water supplies uh, if there are some uh, available um, or recharge the aquifer system. Now, of course, there's natural recharge to the aquifer system, but remember the aquifer system that's in trouble is the deep one, right? It has that Corcoran clay on top of it. It's really hard to recharge that deep system um, using um, artificial means. Sometimes we build big ponds and we put water in it and let it infiltrate. There's a lot of experiments going on now in the San Joaquin Valley where they're using what's called on-farm recharge. So some brave farmers have allowed floodwaters to be redirected onto their land during the winter to let that infiltrate. Um, again, depending on where you are, that means you're recharging the upper system. But there are some places that are recharging the deeper system, and that tends to be closer to the Sierra Nevada's uh, range. Kern County is really, really good at it. They have a lot of coarse grain material, not as much clay in that area, and so they allow the water to infiltrate, and it recharges the aquifer system. Where we're really going now is trying to figure out how to use or store the water when it's available because it's available in the winter and the spring. The farmers really need it in the summer. Um, so the good news is, is that California finally implemented a law to manage groundwater resources. There has not been laws to manage groundwater resources in California. Uh, we've had laws in place since uh, 1914 to manage surface waters, but they left groundwater off of that. Uh, and uh, to not let a good crisis go to waste, right, during the drought, they implemented this law. And it's really a pretty cool law because they give the locals the responsibility to do it. And they're not going to, the state's not going to say, oh, well, you have to, you know, reduce your withdrawal or you have to do this or you have to do that. They said to the locals, you figure it out, but you're not allowed to cause undesirable results. <laughs> <laughs> the undesirable results include land subsidence. Okay, they include a bunch of other things too. Surface water depletion, reduction of storage, you can't degrade the water quality, uh, seawater intrusion, um, right, so surface water depletion, you can't just put a well right next to a stream and pump the hell out of it, and uh, that's, that's not permitted, right? So, uh, so it really gives the locals a ton of flexibility, also an enormous responsibility to figure that out. Uh, and and they're, they're working on that now. Uh, they're writing plans. Um, the plans are due next year, and they submit those to the Department of Water Resources. The Department of Water Resources will look over the plans and say, okay, this looks like a reasonable approach, um, go for it. Or they may say, well, wait a minute, you think a foot a year of subsidence is reasonable? That's not reasonable, right? That's, so, um, so there's going to be some sort of iterations in some, some cases. Um, they have 40 years to come into sustainability. I'm sorry, 20 years to come into sustainability. Uh, and, and that may seem like a really long time, but there are check-ins. We didn't get into this problem overnight. And this is, a, you know, without groundwater uh, laws previously, there's not a lot of data that's been collected in some areas. They're really scrambling to try to learn about their aquifer systems and figure out a plan of how to bring them into sustainability. Uh, and so that it, it'll be, you know, interest, it's a really, really interesting time uh, to be sort of um, in the groundwater world um, to see how this is all going to play out. Um, there's new groundwater agencies that have been created to do this. 
And like I said, they're sort of scrambling now to figure out how are we going to bring it into sustainability? How are we going to avoid these undesirable results? And so I'm optimistic. You know, we've never had groundwater laws before. Usually California is kind of first on a lot of things, and we're last in this case. Right? And so we know lowering groundwater levels and land subsidence are linked. So really, if they take care of the lowering of groundwater levels, they take care of the subsidence. This is just a summary of the things I've, I've talked about today. Uh, I'm not going to uh, read it, um, but I have um, I've enjoyed this. And I hope you have too. I hope, you hope you've learned something. I really appreciate you coming. And I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. If you have a question, you're going to need to get up and go to the microphone to ask it so that our viewers online can hear your question. My daughter lives in the Coachella Valley just south of Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge number of golf courses there that water from groundwater all the time. Now, I imagine most of that water that they've hit the ground sinks back down into the ground. Is it, just, is it true that they just lose it mostly through the evaporation? So Coachella Valley is actually a really cool story. I've been uh, working down there since the mid-90s. And um, fortuitously for them, they, they actually paid attention um, to the day they sort of contacted us in the mid-90s to say, you know, we're worried about subsidence because we know we have lowering groundwater levels. So we've been measuring subsidence since the mid-1990s. Uh, mid and just around 2010, they've been really implementing a lot of programs to reduce groundwater withdrawal, including uh, agreements where they get more out of the Colorado River Basin, uh, tiered rate structures, and manage groundwater recharge. And since 2010, we've seen a remarkable change in the Coachella Valley. And almost everywhere that had been subsiding before that stopped. And the few small areas that continued were at about half the rate. Uh, so that's, it's, it's actually a success story. And they, got, they didn't know this law was coming in 2014 when they were doing all this. They've been working at this since the early 70s. Uh, all these projects to try to reduce groundwater reliance. And so they're sort of a good example of um, how other water agencies can, can look to see what they did to reduce their groundwater withdrawal. I mean, they're in the desert. So it seems to me like if they figured it out, then there's a way for most basins to, to figure it out. What made it stop? What, they still have the evaporation from the golf courses. They do. They do have evaporation, but they've put most, uh, not most, but many of the golf courses on surface water. So they've essentially reduced their demand for groundwater. That's how they have dealt with it. So they're still watering the golf courses. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, can you give me some idea of how fast groundwater moves, like you, know, you recharge from a basin or something? I mean, I'm sure it varies with the composition of the earth it, and everything, but does. can you just give me a range? I have no idea. Yeah, it, it does. It's not, um, it's not weeks, maybe months. It, it depends on how high the groundwater table is. It also, as you first start recharging and it's working its way down through dry sediments, it's really not even getting to the water table. <clears throat> Uh, it's really just wetting the sediments, and then water that is applied after that goes through much, much faster. But it's, it's, uh, it's not weeks, it's months to years. So what kind of effects do you think you'll possibly see draining the world's largest natural gas field, like the Marcellus Shale, and maybe keeping in mind that it's not you know, the same permeability, porosity kind of regime that you would see in like a sand aquifer. What kind of effects, if any, do you think you'll see draining the world's largest uh, natural gas field like the Marcellus Shale? Yeah, so I, I haven't studied uh, that area, but there is also oil and gas withdrawal um, in the San Joaquin Valley. 
um, especially around Bakersfield, a little bit as, as you go south. And what we see from oil and gas fields is that it tends to be much more localized. It's pretty severe subsidence, but it's, it's fairly localized around their wells, and, and they have regular collapsing of their wells, and that's sort of a cost of doing business to them. They realize that that's going to happen. Uh, and we do see severe subsidence, and in fact, some of the, the INSAR data uh, that we use sort of covers part of like the Kettleman Hills area uh, that there's a lot of, um, of the tr you know, withdrawal, and, uh, and it sort of swamps um, some of the other areas. It really sticks out as an area that subsides very quickly. Um, but it tends to be very local, so um, not knowing about the, the shale that, that you're talking about, I'm not, I'm not really sure. But, um, you know, like in the Netherlands, the Groningen gas field uh, has, has had a lot of subsidence there. Um, but the Dutch are pretty, they're pretty smart about water. They are, they're, they're really, they, I mean, they have to live with it. it. You know, where they actually talk about, yeah, we're gonna have to, you know, migrate uh, our people away from the coast as more subsidence happens, but they, they actually make that stuff happen. We just kind of talk about it, mostly. <laughs> yeah, thank you. On one of your charts, uh, you had the, um, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of subsidence uh, underneath that one um, bypass. Yeah. Is that a coincidence? Um, well, it's not because of the bypass. It's because hmm. that is an area that doesn't have access to surface water. And we've been changing land use out there. So um, in areas that used to be either rangeland or maybe um, row crops or truck crops, have now turned to permanent crops, so trees um, and vines, primarily. And that kind of this creates a, what we call demand hardening. You know, with, um, with crops like tomatoes and peppers, you can fallow that land when the water isn't available. But with permanent crops, you have to water them um, no matter what, or you, you lose that entire asset. So, um, so it's not that the that the bypass is there, but it's that land use has changed significantly in that area. Yeah, so that would indicate that maybe these farmers, when they figure it out, will change their crops. I or think that's definitely going to be part of the solution. The options, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it just reminded me of, like, I lived in Davis, and they had the Yolo Causeway, mm -hmm. and uh, so every winter that thing would flood. And that seems like a wonderful way to, you know, recharge the aquifers is just let it flood. Yeah, right. Right, and, and taking, you know, taking the flood water off of those, um, those channels and putting them into farms and putting them into places that will actually recharge, you know, take more advantage of that water when we have it. And you know, moving forward as the climate warms, you know, more precipitation is going to be falling as rain as opposed to snow, and the snowpack is our biggest bank of water, right? Stays nice and frozen, comes down slow, we can take advantage of that in the winter, uh, and now that's um, you know that is going to become less and less as the climate warms. So the idea of being able to capture that water because in winter now, right, it's going to be coming down more as water and flowing out fast. So if there's a way to capture that and recharge our aquifer system, then we're really using it as a as a managed reservoir, just like we would a surface reservoir. Yeah, correct, and use some of that injection to get it into the deeper areas. Yeah, yeah, we've done direct well injection and a couple of experiments here and there. Um, there's a you know on large scale issues that's it's hard because it's just a well. You can only put so much water in a well, uh, and not only that, there's some there's some chemistry issues that happen, especially with uh, with treated water that you put in a well. Um, that it reacts with the native sediments and can cause some um, water quality problems. So, uh, so it's a it's a way to go, but it's it's probably not the answer. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Sir. Hi. Uh, toward the end of your presentation, you had uh, a kind of an eye-opening photo. The guy is saying with a pole. 1965 to 2016. Yeah. 1965. Some that that was where the land was. Is now how much? The question I have: How much of that in those 51 years 
the drought we just had, four or five year drought, I, I would imagine that drought contributed to a, a good chunk of that drop. So, uh, so I showed you a couple of photos, but yeah, what we're, we're finding is there's definitely more subsidence during droughts, yeah. but subsidence is also occurring um, when we're not in drought. So it's really not a drought related phenomenon everywhere. It's, it's what's happened is the, the land use change has ramped up the water demand and um, we're not, you know, we don't really have sort of more, more water for it. So, so it's really the, a land use change um, that's affecting it, that has increased our, our demand, our needs for water. We had, um, a little follow-up question. We had these rains we've had, a pretty decent winter for a change. Mm -hmm. How much does that help with the groundwater? Uh, uh, you know, it's probably, in 51 years, probably a drop in the bucket, I guess, is the way we had now, but uh, how much, we have winters like we're just coming out of now. Does, does, does that help as much as I think it would? Yeah, when I showed those, those photos comparing um, uh, 1965 to 2016 mm -hmm. and then 1965 to 2018, really between 2016 and 18, uh, subsidence stopped in a lot of places because that, you know, 2017 was really, really quite wet. Yeah. Uh, and, and water levels recovered in, in all the sites that I monitor, water levels recovered all summer long. And I haven't ever seen that in my career. And I talked to farmers and they said that some of them never even turned a well on that summer because enough surface water was being delivered at the right time for them to be able to utilize. So they didn't even have to turn their pumps on. Pretty, so it does help a lot. Pretty amazing, um, yeah. Yeah, but we don't have years like that often enough, at least you know, in the past uh, 15 years, it's been yeah. dry. Yeah, uh, that, 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 uh, that's why the guy saw the poll in 1965 to 16, that was a very eye-opening photo, if you look at that thing there. there. Yeah, oh well that's why it's used in, I would say, 97% of all the subsidence talks I've seen around the world. Yeah. <laughs> it was brilliant, it was really, it was a brilliant way to Boy. illustrate subsidence, because it really does, it really does open your eyes. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, how much does it cost to collect all this data? What's a GPS station cost? Um, so uh, it depends who installs it. Um, there's, so we, we don't actually install those. There's other agencies that do that. And I think the last time I asked about a cost it was something like um, about 50,000 to put one in. And then they maintain the data. So it's all telemetered and they process the data every day. And I, I think the, the sort of operation and maintenance costs were, were pretty low. Uh, as long as the sites aren't vandalized or anything like that, those, those equipment can last a long time. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Where is all this leading? What's the, what's the future? Yeah, subsidence is, is, I know, I know, it's difficult. <laughs> Difficult question, but you've painted a rather uh, gloom and doom story. Subsidence, we don't recover from subsidence. Hey, I ended on a happy note. We have lots. <laughs> you haven't talked, really haven't factored in climate change very much, and I'm wondering, uh, you did talk about sea, sea level rise, but I'm wondering how climate change and other factors might, you know, uh, tell, inform us about the next 50 or 100 years. Any yeah. ideas? Well, so climate change, um, the way it's kind of looking, uh, climate um, scientists think that it's not necessarily that we're going to become drier, we're just not going to have as much snowpack. And so that impacts when the water is available, right? And it, we really like a deep, good snowpack because um, our reservoirs that hold the water, right, those get drained, start get draining in March, April, right, as we plant the crops. And those start, and then they're getting sort of backfilled with this slow drip of snow melt. And as less snow is going to fall because it's getting warmer, well, that water is gonna come down too soon. Uh, and so, uh, right, it's gonna come down as water, it's not gonna stay as snow, right, it's water, so it comes down much, much faster. 
And so to figure out a way to capture those, that water when it's coming down by these on-farm recharge projects or these settling ponds that I'm talking about uh, seems to be a, a really good approach. And there's a, a ton of, of work going on in that area. So the other part of sort of the, the good news story is this new groundwater law because it doesn't tell them how to use the water. It just says you can't cause these bad things to happen, right? And so they can start to figure out what works in their particular basin, and that's going to be vastly different um, for basins in you know, northern Sacramento Valley as opposed to basins in the deserts. Uh, and their solutions are going to be vastly different, and it's going to be a combination of a lot of things um, with sort of the... the goal to being, you know, not reducing, uh, you know, those groundwater levels, to ha have them level off. Seasonal changes are normal. If we just, seasonal change, right, elastic response, no problem. These are very small. These don't damage uh, infrastructure on the surface. It's when we do this over and over and over again. Hi, I'm Esther with Say Palo Alto's groundwater, and um, I'm going to bring the groundwater to the Bay Area. Um, we got involved with groundwater because um, uh, here in the Bay Area, the groundwater level is high, and to build basements, people were pumping out the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, some, some of the neighbors, not me, <laughs> thankfully, um, had damage to their houses. And we kept saying it's subsidence, and the cities kept saying it can't be. You, you, this is just anecdotal. Nothing happens, no, no problems. Um, they're starting to accept that, that, that we're having subsidence with pumping out so much groundwater. Uh, one basement pumped out um, 30 million gallons of water just to build one basement, so the neighbors were impacted. Um, and uh, we have a talk coming up on April 24th, and this is, will be about the impact of sea level rise on the groundwater in the bay. Thank you. Great. What area? What area? What area? The bay. The bay area. Yes. Well, that looks like one more question. Oh, please come on. Burning question. Yeah, burning question, yeah, right. I work in the map, so I'm just You, curious, if you need to get to the microphone. Gonna, yeah, make it go to the mic. <laughs> As I said, I work in the maps department uh, at one of the companies around here. Um, I'm just curious about the remote sensing part that you talked about. Yeah. These days, there's a lot of satellites being launched. I'm just curious if some of these are going to be deployed for, you know, the groundwater that we're talking about here in the, in the area, the places where, you know, some of these GPS units are too expensive or vandalized a lot or what are those kinds of things? How do you see this working not only in California but around the world, the other places that really don't have the resources that we have here in the United yeah, States? Yeah, so interestingly enough, uh, the United States does not currently have the capability to collect that kind of data. Um, but we're working on it. Um, there is a satellite that is scheduled to be launched in 2021. One satellite. It will have an eight-day repeat, meaning it's going to image the same area every eight days. Uh, the data we primarily uh, rely on these days is a European Space Agency satellite <laughs> constellation called Sentinel. And it is collecting data every six days. Uh, and so, uh, and there, there is a... Um, there's some rumbling in industry and have and private contractors launching um, satellite constellations that will collect this type of data. So right now I, it's worldwide every uh, six days in, in many places from the European Space Agency. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else at the microphone. Going, going, gone. <laughs> Let's. Uh, yeah, give a warm round of applause to Michelle. Thank you very much. And I'm going to remind you, if you can please come back on April 18th for that uh, talk on ecological forecasting for California. Look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks.